Floosh, Chisan Kanawi Masaga, Tot George Hukwa, and I'm here bringing you a couple of chapters today out of my side of the mountain, because the next chapter is rather short. But before we get started, let's take care of our housekeeping items. Uh, first off, I tried to make Jake laying down in the Jake of the Day drawing. I don't know if it looks like a dog or not. Mostly not. Uh, you can always send your Jakes of the Day to my email address, which is hiding up here on the Brock Lobster Castle. And remember, if you guys need any help out in the community, you can reach out to our food pantry, 503-879-FOOD. And if there's any other kind of help, they might be able to help you at 503-879-HELP. So again, this, uh, this novel here doesn't have chapters like a normal book would, so the next one is rather short, so we'll do two. This chapter would be, what, chapter three. The manner in which I find Gribbley's farm. The next day, I told Bill goodbye, and as I strode, warm and fed onto the road, he called to me, I'll see you tonight. The back door will be open if you want a roof over your head. I said, okay. But I knew I wouldn't see Bill again. I knew how to make a fire, and that was my weapon. With fire, I could conquer the cat skills. You're not a cat skill, you're a cat. I also knew how to fish, to fish and to make a fire. That was all I needed to know, I thought. Three rides that morning took me to Delhi. Somewhere around here was Great Grandfather's Beech Tree with the name Gribbly carved on it. This much I knew from Dad's stories. By six o'clock, I still had not found anyone who had even heard of the Gribblies, much less Gribbly's Beach. And so I slept on the porch of a schoolhouse and ate chocolate bars for supper. It was cold and hard, but I was so tired I could have slept in a wind tunnel. At dawn, I thought real hard. Where would I find out about the Gribbly farm? Some old map, I said. Where would I find an old map? Ah, the library. Maybe. I'd try it and see. The librarian was very helpful. She was sort of young, had brown hair and brown eyes, and loved books as much as I did. The library didn't open until 10.30. I got there at 9.00. After I'd lolled and rolled and sat on the steps for 15 or 20 minutes, the door whisked open, and this tall lady asked me to come on in and browse around until opening time. All I said to her was that I wanted to find the old Gribbly farm, and that the Gribblies hadn't lived on it for maybe a hundred years. And she was off. I can still hear her heels clicking when I think of her, scattering herself around those shells, finding me old maps, histories of the Catskills, and files of letters and deeds that must have come from attics around Delhi. Miss Turner, that was her name, found it. She found Gribbley's farm in an old book of Delaware County. Then she worked out the roads to it and drew me maps and everything. Finally, she said, What do you want to know for? Some school project? Oh no, Miss Turner, I want to go live there. But Sam, it is all forests and trees now. The house is probably only a foundation covered with moss. Well, that's just what I want. I'm going to trap animals and eat nuts and bulbs and berries and make myself a house. You see, I am Sam Gribbley, and I thought I would like to live on my great-grandfather's farm. Miss Turner was the only person that believed me. She smiled, sat back in her chair, and said, Well, I declare. The library was just opening when I gathered the notes we had made and started off. As I pushed open the door, Miss Turner leaned over and said to me, Sam, we have some very good books on plants and trees and animals in case you get stuck. I knew what she was thinking, and so I told her I would remember that. With Ms. Turner's map, I found the first stone wall that marked the farm. The old roads to it were all grown up and mostly gone, but by locating the stream at the bottom of the mountain, I was able to begin at the bridge and go north and up a mile and a half. There, caterpillaring around the boulders, roller coastering up ravines and down hills, was the mound of rocks that had once been Great Grandfather's boundary fence. And then, do you know, I couldn't believe it, I was there. I sat on the old gray stones a long time, looking through the forest, up that steep mountain, and saying to myself, It must be Sunday afternoon, and it's raining, and Dad is trying to keep us all quiet by telling us about Great Grandfather's farm. And he's telling it so real, and I can see it. And then I said, No, I am here, because I was never this hungry before. I wanted to run all the way back to the library and tell Miss Turner that I had found it, partly because she would have liked to have known, and partly because Dad had said to me as I left, If you find the place, tell someone at Delhi. I may visit you someday. 
Of course he was kidding, because he thought I'd be home the next day. But, after many weeks, maybe he would think I meant what I said, and he might come to see me. However, I was too hungry to run back. I took my hook and line and went back down to the mountain to the stream. I caught a big old catfish. I climbed back to the stone wall in great spirits. It was getting late, and so I didn't try to explore. I went right to work, making a fire. I decided that even if I didn't have enough time to cut boughs for a bed, I was going to have cooked fish and a fire to huddle around during those cold night hours. May is not exactly warm in the Catskills. By firelight that night, I wrote this. Dear Bill, that was the old man. After three tries, I finally got a handful of dry grass on the glow in the tinder. Grass is even better than pine needles. And tomorrow, I am going to try the outside bark of the river birch. I read somewhere that it has combustible oil in it and that the Indians used to start fires. Anyway, I did just what you showed me and had cooked catfish for dinner. It was good. Your friend, Sam. After I wrote that, I remembered I didn't know his last name, and so I stuffed the note in my pocket and made myself a bed of boughs and leaves in the shelter of the stone wall and fell right to sleep. I must say this now about that first fire. It was magic. Out of dead tinder and grass and sticks came a live warm light. It cracked and snapped and smoked and filled the woods with brightness. It lighted the trees and made them warm and friendly. It stood tall and bright and held back the night. Oh, this was a different night than the first dark, frightful one. Also, I was stuffed on catfish. I have since learned to cook it more, but never have I enjoyed a meal as much as that one. And never have I felt so independent again. All right, that brings us to the next chapter. What would this be? Chapter four, in which I find many useful plants. The following morning, I stood up, stretched, and looked about me. Birds were dripping from the trees, little birds, singing and flying and pouring over the limbs. This must be the warbler migration, I said, and I laughed because there were so many birds I had never seen so many. My big voice rolled through the woods, and their little voices seemed to rise and answer me. They were eating. Three or four in a maple tree near me were darting along the limbs, pecking and snatching at something delicious on the trees. I wondered if there was anything there for a hungry boy. I pulled a limb down, and all I saw were leaves, twigs, and flowers. I ate a flower. It was not very good. One manual I had read said to watch what the birds and animals were eating in order to learn what is edible and non-edible in the forest. If the animal life can eat it, it is safe for humans. The book did suggest that a raccoon had tastes more nearly like ours. Certainly, the birds were no example. Then I wondered if they were not eating something I couldn't see. Tiny insects, perhaps? Well, anyway, whatever it was, I decided whew, to fish. I took my line and hook and walked down to the stream. I lay in a log and dangled my line in the bright water. The fish were not biting. That made me hungrier. My stomach pinched. You know, it really does hurt to be terribly hungry. A stream is supposed to be full of food. It is the easiest place to get a lot of food in a hurry. I needed something in a hurry. But what? I looked through the clear water and saw the tracks of mussels in the mud. I ran along the log back to shore, took off my clothes, and plunged into that icy water. I collected almost a peck of mussels in very little time at all, and began tying them in my sweater to carry them back to camp. But I don't have to carry them anywhere, I said to myself. I have my fire in my pocket. I don't need a table. I can sit right here by the stream and eat. So I did. I wrapped the mussels in leaves and sort of steamed them in coals. They were not quite as good as clams. A little bit stronger, I would say. But by the time I had eaten three, I had forgotten what clams tasted like and knew only how delicious freshwater mussels were. I actually got full. I wandered back to Great Grandfather's farm and began to explore. Most of the acreage was maple and beech, some pine, dogwoods, ash, and here and there, a glorious hickory. I made a sketch of the farm on my road map and put X's where the hickories were. They were gold trees to me. I would have hickory nuts in the fall. 
I could also make salt from hickory limbs. I cut off one and chopped it into bits and scraps. I stuck them in my sweater. The land was up and down and up and down, and I wondered how great-grandfather ever cut it and plowed it. There was one stream running through it, which I was glad to see, for it meant I did not have to go all the way down the mountains to the big creek for fish and water. Around noon, I came upon where I came upon what I was sure was the old foundation of the house. Miss Turner was right. It was ruins. A few stones in a square, a slight depression for the basement, and trees growing right up through what had once been the living room. I wandered around to see what was left of the Gribbly home. After a few looks, I saw an apple tree. I rushed up to it, hoping to find an old apple. No apples beneath it. About 40 feet away, however, I found a dried one in the crotch of a tree, stuck there by a squirrel and forgotten. I ate it. It was pretty bad, but nourishing. I hope there was another apple tree, or there was another apple tree, and three walnuts. I scribbled X's. These were wonderful finds. I poked around the foundations, hoping to uncover some old iron implements that I could use. I found nothing. Too many leaves had fallen and turned to loam. Too many plants had grown up and died down over the old home site. I decided to come back when I had made myself a shovel. Whistling and looking for food and shelter, I went on up the mountain, following the stone walls, discovering many things about my property. I found a marsh. In it were cattails and arrow leaf, good starchy foods. At high noon, I stepped onto a mountain meadow. An enormous boulder rose up in the center of it. At the top of the meadow was a fringe of white birch. There were maples and oaks to the west and a hemlock forest to the right that pulled me right across the sweet grasses into it. Never, never have I seen such trees. These were giants, old, old giants. They must have begun when the world began. I started walking around them. I couldn't hear myself step. So dense and damp were those needles. Great boulders covered with ferns and moss stood among them. They looked like pebbles beneath those trees. Standing before the biggest and oldest and the most king-like of them all, I suddenly had an idea. All right, Cubit Kagwa Ugu, that's all for that. Uh, we'll have to see what his glorious idea for that great king-like uh, tree was next time. Uh, remember, since we're not doing vocab or short answers, you can always send a response to my email about something you enjoyed about the story or maybe somewhere you would go live out in the forest. Well, that's all for now. Uh, Hayamasi, Kanoe Masaiga, and Afki Pasalda. I'll see you guys next time.